Um, so we were looking to develop uh, methods that would enable us to downscale from daily data uh, to hourly data. And um, an awful lot of work was put in by the members of the group, including Luca, Jake, Dipali, Natalie, and, and like Lina. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Okay. And so the presentation is going to give you a quick overview of the problem, look at the methods that we studied, feature some key results and a summary. And if we get time, we're going to look at some future work. Next slide, please. So the aim of the project was to develop some downscaling techniques from daily data to hourly data. We were going to use the ERA-5 reanalysis data, which was available from 1979 to 2020. And the variables that we were interested in downscaling were the two meter temperatures, the 10 meter wind speeds and the surface uh, solar irra uh, irradiance. Um, this is more a downscaling methodology than a prediction methodology. So we could use information about um, the days in the past as well as the days in the future because we just wanted to develop a downscaling to the hourly. We, um, we wanted the methodologies to account for the diurnal cycle and if possible, the synoptic scale meteorology. And uh, Hannah, uh, in some earlier work had produced a seasonal diurnal cycle and we were going to use that as our benchmark to see if we can do any better. Next slide please Hannah. So uh, the era five reanalysis is hourly data is on a 30 kilometer uh, grid. We were going to use the training period from 1979 to 2017 and then use um, bits and pieces of the data from 2018 to 2020 as our validation. And below is the list of fields that we had from the era data, which we thought would be useful for us. Next slide, please. So the, we had three case studies and these were um, given to us by um, uh, Daniel. Uh, so one was from November 18, uh, 25 to 2019. And this was a period where we had very high energy demand and very variable wind speeds. Then we had a very warm period from July the 10th, 1st to the 10th in 2020. This was a period of low energy demand, but there was lots of sun and wind. We were also in the first uh, COVID lockdown period. And this was the first time that solar PV were asked to reduce generation. And the third case study was the beast from the east. So that was back in 2018 from February to March. So again, what we were interested in downscaling in those periods was the uh, temperature, wind speed, and surface shortwave radiation from, uh, daily uh, from daily values to hourly values. Okay, next slide, please. We all sort of took a number of different methods and looked at them, and we're gonna talk about the more successful methods to come. Um, and we also did it at a number of different uh, levels. So the green squares represent people who aggregated the data up to the national level. So they ended up with one time series for the UK. The black squares represented uh, people who tried to um, downscale on a grid scale basis and then at the end would aggregate up to the national scale. And the bluey greeny scales represented those people who did both. I think people are now going to talk about what they actually did. And I believe the temperature one is the first one off. Yes. Can you hear me? So for temperature, we took two avenues of modeling. Um, and we wanted to model hourly temperatures, obviously downscaling from a daily average to hourly. Uh, we did machine learning and a simple downscaling method. Uh, we used national scale data for the UK because the, the main issue is using grid point data, given the amount of time we had to do this project, the computational expenses were too much and we didn't, there was time constraints. So the machine learning methods we used were linear regression and random force, which are two very simple machine learning methods, but they're also very powerful and they're easy to apply to data sets. So uh, the input variables we use for these machine learning methods included temperatures, cloud cover, maximum and minimum temperatures for the day, uh, solar radiation, 
And also the NAO index was explored as along with uh, surface pressure, but these were removed because um, they didn't give a good example of the synoptic scale features which we were looking to try to implement into the model uh, to get the, the hourly temperatures. Um, for the downscaling method, only temperatures and the maximum and minimum temperatures were used for that method. And a range was actually calculated using the maximum and minimum temperatures and fed into that model. Now, model error increased for the machine learning methods in the cold season. And an example of this is if you look at the case study three, the beast from the east, you can see there's a, a strong diurnal cycle, but then there's an increase in temperatures and there's no prominent diurnal cycle. And the machine learning models struggled. Yeah, there we go. And the machine learning models struggled to capture this very well. Uh, the downscaling method actually captured it decently well, but um, that's because in the winter time we tend to see not not as prominent uh, diurnal cycles in comparison to the summertime. Now, both machine learning methods and downscaling methods outperform the benchmark methods. But again, like I said, downscaling was superior. And on the right, you can see case study one, case study two, and case study three. Almost all the methods are very similar to the, the true value, but the, the downscaling method was superior slightly, looking at the RMSD values. The next slide. Um, what happened there? <laughs> Sorry, that's not saved very well. Um, yeah. Um, it's uh, it's okay. I will just talk through it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I was working on um, the prediction of wind speed. So this is a, a quite uh, an interesting case because you don't see these strong diurnal cycles as you see in temperatures or solar irradiation. So just in, in, at a first, first glance, it does it seems like a good candidate uh, for machine learning methods because they are able to capture some you know nonlinearities in the systems that are not very obvious to model directly. Um, and so here, um, taking the same uh, linear regression and random forests as uh, Luca presented in the previous slide uh, for the machine learning side, and then um, um, Jake uh, modeled uh, this behavior using a piecewise third order uh, polynomial, which is in red. Um, you see that uh, in, in, in uh, all of the three cases, uh, the predictions are quite uh, a bit better than the, the benchmark that we were given. And uh, the trends, uh, especially uh, the ramp up and ramp down on most days are predicted uh, quite well by the machine learning models. However, you see that at low wind speeds in general, the, there is a strong under prediction of the absolute uh, values of the winds. And this is still something that we're um, you know, in, in the process of understanding because uh, the, the weight that should be associated with the, the mean wind speeds that are given as an input should be higher and you shouldn't see such a big under prediction at low wind speeds. Um, but then this is something that uh, needs to be looked at in, in more detail when there's uh, more time. Uh, but in general, um, if we just look at the mean squared error, it seems to be very low for the polynomial fit. But again, if you're interested in the ramp up and ramp down uh, of the winds, uh, probably machine learning models um, are more uh, relevant in this case. Yes, we can move on to the next slide. Uh, hello. So the third variable we're looking at was the solar radiation. Uh, and again, the same methods were used, uh, linear regression and the random forest. Um, and a very simple method, which is just a rescaling of the uh, mean historical diurnal cycle with the known daily mean. Uh, and we've got a couple of cases here. We can see that uh, for linear regression, uh, there's occasionally undershoot surface shortwave, which uh, is not what you want particularly. Um, in case two, on the fourth, all cases are over predicting it and it's a bit spiky. Um, so, you know, maybe there's some cloud coming over partway through the day, um, but they're not, not seeming to capture that. Um, and in case three, they all look very similar. You can barely even see the black line because the red line of the very simple rescaling of the historical uh, diurnal cycle is doing so well. Um, so yeah, again, the, the linear regression, the random forest, they do well at reproducing the diurnal cycles, but they're, re uh, they're outperformed by this incredibly simple method. Um, and maybe this is because we're looking at a national average um, because it's less data to work with, um, but perhaps 
uh, on smaller spatial scales um, using more input variables and more sophisticated methods uh, would be more sensible um, for picking up weather features. But in the daily mean, uh, these you know, very simple methods have uh, been very effective. Yeah, okay, and so we did, ten, 10 minute warning now. Yeah, um, we did have a look at good approaches. So we're actually still working on that, but um, to implement this approach is way more difficult than using a national average and takes more computation time and also putting the loops right is a kind of complex thing. Therefore, um, we didn't get as far as the others. Um, however, we took some useful data um, about what to consider and what to con not what not to consider, and we do think that um, the squidded approach will lead to more of to better results. And um, the aim is to not use the whole era five data set, but only look at specific longitude and latitude ranges um, to reduce the computational effort. Um, and using that also taking into account um, neighboring grids and therefore have an overall uh, view of, of the grid and of the data. Yeah. Okay, so just very quickly, we also looked at analog methods. Um, we actually thought these were probably the least promising of everything we looked at because um, we made some analogs um, based on large scale fields. But as you can see in this case study at the top, if your extreme event you're interested in didn't happen in the past, you've got no way of capturing it with an analog. Um, and this is something that, because we picked extreme case studies to validate on, the analogs really struggled with. Um, so just as a summary, um, we we're actually really pleased with how we managed to do for this task. It's quite a bespoke problem, um, but we could definitely recreate diurnal cycles for two meter temperature and short wave radiance. Um, making use of our perfect foresight and hindsight. Um, and potentially there's more value in the machine learning methods at the gridded scale. Um, downscaling wind speed is very hard and that's definitely where our future work would be going with this. Um, and it was really nice to see that the simple methods actually do very well for these kind of jobs. So in terms of downscaling climate data from, hourly to, um, from daily to hourly resolution, that's definitely something we feel much happier with now. Thank you. Great, thank you very much to everyone in group one. Should we ever give a, an online clap? <laughs> Great, thank you, loads of, loads of progress there, all kinds of interesting results coming out. Um, so we'll have a couple of brief questions. We've got a question in the chat already from Laurent um, asking uh, for solar radiation, did you try using the clear sky radiation? Um, no. But um, partially, at least on the um, on on the national average scale, it's because we didn't really need to so much. I mean, just using the daily mean uh, solar radiation and the historical diurnal cycle reproduced the uh, hourly time series incredibly well just with that one variable. Uh, but no, we didn't look at that. Again, maybe something that would be useful on a gridded scale. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Great. Okay, so we have one. Uh question from Stephen Haben. I think if, any, if anyone wants to ask a question, then um, then put your hand up or, or mention it in the chat. Um, yes, question from Stephen. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I didn't want to uh, <laughs> uh, interrupt anyone. No, great. Uh, there's a couple of, couple of quick questions, really. I guess, um, wh why did you choose only extreme events? I guess the with machine learning methods, often they train well on, um, obviously they're important events, extreme events, but I guess obviously to benchmark in some ways to see how good the methods could do, maybe it'd be great to do it on something that has lots of typical events or maybe choose a, a sort of standard day just to kind of some benchmark things and see how well you could really do. Um, and I guess another one is um, the sort of methods for re recreating sort of realistic features. Um, common ones are sort of the generalized, uh, uh, the uh, generative adversarial networks. Were they sort of considered or discussed? Um, I th to answer your first question, uh, we, I, we used three case studies. Uh, I did, we did make some plots for just two general two week periods in the summer and the winter to make comparisons. Uh, again, with the machine learning methods, they were still not as good as the, uh, 
uh, the downscaling method. And using GANs, general adversarial networks, we didn't consider those. Uh, maybe we did consider, uh, we were speaking about recurrent neural networks because we're using time series data. So establishing like a memory base. But uh, again, we had an issue with time constraints and the amount of computational resources we had. So simpler did prove better in this situation. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, thank you. I think just to add to that, with the ex a lot of the time, um, the extremes is what people are interested in as well, right? For power system modeling. And I guess the sleeps to group two, like Laura's data set, which they're going to talk about is at daily resolution, which, and it's all kind of based around big extreme events. So potentially we were trying to make techniques here, which could be used by that group if we, you know, in future to downscale those data sets. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, I was just thinking as a benchmark, perhaps, or at least sort of something to compare to. Yeah, we certainly made it hard, right? <laughs> yeah, that's good, that's good. <laughs> Great, so there was another question in the chat from Mark. Did you want to, to say it out loud, Mark? Yeah. And yes, sorry, I, don't, I can't remember the slides now on wooden speed, but I seem to remember it contained, you know, the full range of your analysis. And I was just wondering whether or not you had done any work focusing in on speed set so might be of most relevance or interest to, to users. Um, so I'm guessing that they're only interested in wins up to a certain threshold, but I'm not an expert in this field. Uh, do, do you mean filtering out uh, the wind speeds for training? Because we did not uh, do uh, any, we did not put any bias on any sort of wind speed range. Uh, we trained it over all the data, um, randomly picked from the last uh, 40 years. Thank you. So I'm just reading the chat as well. Um, I just wasn't quite sure if not any of the values you were looking at were, were actually above the range that users would be interested in. Mm. Yeah, but from what David just said, that's not the case. Yeah. No. Great. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. Um, Dan, do you want to have a question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, slightly tangential, I think. You present the metric as sort of mean square or root mean square error. What we're really interested in is the sort of the extreme values within those extreme events. Is there, do you know of a good metric where you could say how well you represent those really extreme periods? Rather than just the mean, it does quite well overall. Does it really get those extreme hours? Yeah, that's a really good question. We actually, when we were making this presentation, we kind of discussed that. We were like, oh, with hindsight, you know, we started using mean absolute error, actually, and we realized all of Jake's methods, the mean absolute error is zero by construction. So we had to find another metric, but root mean square error, we picked for simplicity. I think if we had, you know, a bit more time in a larger group, the verification of this is really important, right? And as you say, depending on what you're interested in, you need a, met a different metric. I personally can't, think of something off the top of my head, which would be really good for that. But definitely with a bit more time, that would be a good thing to think of. Because some of these methods you'd imagine, the ones that don't look best in the mean square error might actually be getting the extremes a bit better. Great. Uh, yeah, Stephen, then jump to have one last say and um, move on. Yeah, uh, just... Um obviously you're looking at sort of intraday from daily did you consider going the other ways with this so either sort of try and increase the resolution you just do it every six hours every 12 hours or going further than that and saying well we've only got you know weekly and we'll we'll see if we can get sort of daily or down so one of our group members kind of did this natalia was looking at Fourier decompositions um and sadly she's not here this afternoon so she can't she can't talk about this but that actually that works on a lot of different timescales that kind of method and was able to it looked really promising on a lot of different timescales for reconstruction so um yeah we focused on this um that for the bulk of the problem getting from the daily down to, but some of the methods i think would work quite well on a range of timescales great Brilliant. So uh, I guess there's uh, some ongoing challenges, but then um, uh, 
I guess with only a week's worth of work, uh, we wouldn't expect everything to be completely solved within a week. So, uh, so uh, it's nice to know that uh, uh, there's still some things in this area to think about. Yeah.